Fantastic. All right, thanks very much for your patience, everyone. We just had a slight technical glitch here at the beginning of the conference, so <laughs> thank you very kindly to Agile Ware from Canberra. A little plug there for the, <laughs> for the uh, replacement adapter. Um, my name is Mark Matushka. I'm track chair of the business and strategy track, and I'd like to welcome you to the very first uh, session uh, today. Um, uh, it'll be my uh, honour over the next two days to introduce uh, the business and strategy uh, sessions to you. And uh, today we have um, a session entitled Applied Agile for Drupal Projects by Vesa Palmo. How's that? Close enough. Close enough. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'll work on it over the next couple of days. Um, this session will be of great interest to everyone out there struggling with implementing agile project methodologies for their Drupal projects. Um, and I'm particularly interested in personally, I, I warned him I was going to throw in a question here right at the beginning in the intro, how agile projects can be costed, because that's relevant to a session a little later on today. Tricky question, huh? I know, and I saw a tweet regarding that. Um, so um, I'd like to introduce to you uh, Vesa Palmo. He is CEO of one of Europe's uh, largest Drupal organizations, Wunderkraut. Uh, which was formed last year with the merger of four smaller Drupal companies, uh, Node 1, Crimson, Miera, which I'm sure I've pronounced incorrectly, <laughs> um, and Wunderkraut, uh, and they took on the name Wunderkraut. Uh, they operate in either nine or ten European countries and together make up uh, one of the largest, if not the largest, Drupal company development company in the world. Pretty close. Um, you would have seen in the session guide that uh, VESA has ex significant experience managing uh, hundreds of projects, hundreds of web projects, uh, some of, uh, many of them Drupal of, of recently. A particular note is his mention of large project failures, along with hundreds of successes, of course, um, which indicates to me that we'll, what we'll hear this morning is uh, a lot of practical advice and down-to-earth information. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, VESA Palmo. Please welcome him. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, so, thank you for the introduction. Um, so, my name is uh, Vesa Palmo. That's the, the proper way to pronounce it. It was pretty close. Uh, uh, the name is Finnish, so I'm originally from Finland. Uh, today, I'm living in London, though. Uh, but my accent, uh, I, I tried to stick with the Finnish accent a bit to not to feel like a UK person. Um, so, on top of what was already said about me, uh, I have uh, quite a bit of experience in, in doing Agile, uh, both in the world of Drupal and uh, before Drupal, outside of Drupal, in different kind of uh, software projects. I've also done a fair share of teaching Agile to different organizations, and it's uh, one part of my job today is to teach Agile to our customers. So basically everything that I'm talking about today, I've, I've uh, told the same stories to quite a few customers before, so I might get a bit, uh, you know, get into details uh, easily here. Um, I, my basic background is in computer sciences originally. Uh, I never went around to actually graduate from there, did my executive MBAs later, and ended up basically running companies. So the typical story for the computer science students around the world. A um, few more words about uh, Wunderkraut. So wonder what, you might ask. Uh, we are a professional services company for, for web, basically. So we do end-to-end -end services, starting from uh, developing business of our customers, especially uh, media customers, for example. And uh, we end in doing hosting and support services and basically do everything in between, including development and, and so on. About 150 people. And uh, we are today uh, physically have offices in nine European countries, as you can see on the map. We actually have operations in, in quite a few other countries in Europe as well, but you know, it's difficult to do the math on, on where you are physically in Europe and where you are not sometimes. Uh, you might have heard about some of the companies that we merged that were mentioned there, Crimson, Node 1, Meara and, and Wunderkraut. Uh, so we merged for four companies. So basically Trees was this morning talking about we need bigger Drupal shops. We deliver. Uh, so <laughs> we do our best. 
Um, and we intend to, to keep on growing a bit because uh, a lot of our customers are really big enterprises that are asking for global services. So we are trying to meet the need for, for global, uh, basically, Drupal implementations and, and Drupal projects. We do exclusively Drupal as, as far as technologies go. Uh, so we sort of are a bit different from, from many of our bigger competitors, the so-called elephants there. Okay. I'm going to be talking about a few things today, uh, starting with uh, why Agile, why it's a good idea. Uh, I, I'm going to do a bit of introduction to Agile, but this is sort of a sup basic session, so I, I have to ask a few questions about your experience level uh, before, before knowing on how deeply I'm going to go into that. Um, and then I'm going to have a look at some of the basic problems most companies I've, I've worked with are having with Agile especially vendors working with the customer projects. It's really common for them to have, have issues while, while trying to do Agile. And uh, then I'm going to go and have a look at like how, what have we done with Drupal and Agile. We have quite a few years been modifying Agile to, to meet the special requirements that Drupal have. So uh, in order to understand like how much should I actually explain about what Agile is and, and so on, uh, I would first like to ask how many of you have some like hands-on experience in working in, in Agile projects? About half, okay. Um, what about how many of you do projects for, for external customers? About the same number of people. How, how, how many of you actually uh, purchase services from external sources? Not that many. Quite a typical DrupalCon crowd, <laughs> I would say, so far. Um, what about uh, is somebody running your own internal projects with, with Agile or otherwise running your own internal projects? Uh, okay, so quite a diverse bunch of people, really. Um, all right, I'll um, try to spend a bit of time on introducing Agile and uh, then move on to the, the rest of the things. Uh, hopefully, people with plenty of Agile experience get something out of the, the first part of this. So. Let's start with uh, why Agile is, is a uh, great idea. Um, I'm, I'm going to move into this by describing the problem first, because you know I'm a consultant, so what consultants do, you know, you describe the problem first. So I, I know many of you have probably seen this before, but it's it's again it's funny because it's so true. And if, if you've been in software projects, especially complicated software projects, you've seen it before. Uh, so basically. I'm not going to go through all of this, but this is what was actually needed. And here you go, like customer explaining it, uh, analyst designing it, uh, business consultant describing it, of course, uh, billing, usually like this, support, and, and documentation, you know, most of all. So <laughs> this, it's, it's only funny because it happens in, in IT projects quite often. And, and this is one of the problems that Agile tries to, tries to meet or, or solve. Uh, so basically, this is your traditional, what I call personally, design first approach or waterfall, if you f will. It's, it's quite pretty in pictures, and that's about it. It's the same thing in real life. It's really nice if you can do the professional looking Gantt charts and draw all of the schedules for the project and plan out like two years ahead of time in detail. It looks perfect. Everybody loves it. Unfortunately, it sort of fails usually. So it's, it's mostly pretty in pictures. Uh, let, me, let me do an example of that. Let's move into something a bit, I would say, easier for most people. I would imagine everybody knows what this is, like a blueprint of a house. Everybody has been in a house, at least in this room, because we are in a house right now. Uh, so everybody knows the concept of a house. What we have here, uh, I don't think everybody sees it, but this is a kitchen, plan for a kitchen. Uh, so basically, everybody has been in a kitchen. I would assume most of you have been cooking in a kitchen as well. Uh, so you have an idea like based on the uh, blueprint that, well, here we have a oven here and, and we have some sort of like a working, uh, working area here and cabinets and, and whatnot. So you get an idea, well, this is your kitchen and then somebody goes and builds it. But do you actually know how the kitchen is going to feel? Is it going to be a great place to work at when you are when you are preparing food? Can you actually see the oven when when you are preparing some food here? Can you see if the oven that your food is burning already or not? Like small things, but they do make a huge difference on the actual experience. And this is something that everybody knows very very well, like houses. 
I'm not claiming I can build houses, but I, I do know houses pretty intimately. <laughs> so I would imagine I could design it perfectly. But when I in real life go into the house, I'm, I'm going to be a bit confused and I'm most likely to actually want to make some changes. If you move into a new house, this is what happens. It's like, well, the bathroom should be a bit bigger. What if we could just move the wall a bit? There we go. Now it's like half a meter bigger. Perfect. Uh, we can do it in software. At least you should be able to do it. And, and if we can't do it with houses, we can't create perfect houses out of the plan to meet our expectations. How could we do it with something much more complicated like software? We don't know software that well because we, we are not living in software all day. Well, most of us at least. Um, so that's one of the reasons. This is your project. Any project, basically. Um, basically, start of the project. We have minimum knowledge as a team on, on what the project is going to be, what the difficulties will be, and so on. At the end of the project, we know as much about the project as we ever will within the lifespan of the project. At which point do we make the important decisions? It's like this. Uh, let's say uh, here we do a project agreement at some point. Quite a lot of these things, if you write them down in agreement, and this can be an internal agreement or external agreement with the, with the vendor, you will actually fix most of the really important stuff at that point with the minimal knowledge available. So that's the point when you do the important stuff. Then you might have some design phase where you still can do the details. What should we do with this and th that detail on a project? And then we fix it, basically. Just go and implement it. So you, you're not really learning anything because you can't change anything anymore. It's fixed. You know what you're doing. And then you do your launch and you start learning by realizing, well, it's not working really. It's not doing what's, what it's supposed to do. And, and the, you know, the users are not reacting as we expected. So that's sort of the, the problem. Um, then we have some additional like first world problems here. Uh, like we have developers that are fairly well paid in, in Europe and in Australia and US. And, and how do we treat these guys if we do everything design first? They, they are these guys at that point. It's like, you know, don't ask, just implement. You know what you're supposed to do. There's the plan, you know, just go and code it. So these guys, uh, they are end users for the similar kind of products if you are building websites. So they can actually give a lot of input into it. They use the product when they are building it. So basically, they, they learn at the same time. So they could propose all sorts of changes to the product and so on, and they should. But if, if you design all of it, they really can't. So that's the thing. Um, and getting back to my, my house example, if, if you have somebody who builds houses for a living, and if they build a house personally for themselves, do you think they're going to specify everything in detail before they start working on anything? Or, or do they actually just make it up, or at least some of it, while they're doing it? Uh, which way do you think is going to end up being a better house? At least on my experience, some of my friends who, who do that for a living, it's, their houses, houses tend to be amazing because they, they know exactly what they're doing. So, okay, uh, if, if, if I didn't get the point through, one more example. Uh, let's say we have a uh, customer that makes a definition like on, on requirements. And they say, okay, I need to have uh, some sort of transportation device. It has to transport at least 20 bags of rice at the time. And, you know, it has to transport it for 10 kilometers within 15 minutes or something. And, and based on this, what you would imagine to have some sort of like van or whatever truck. And, and then you ask vendors to put in offers and there's some vendors that are cheaper and some that are more expensive. And well, you just go with the cheap one because you are still going to get what you asked for, right? So the expectation is a truck. Well, that's what you actually get. It, it meets your requirements. Every requirement has been met. Your expectations, not so much. And the lifetime value, you know, <laughs> it's going to be a pretty expensive piece of, yeah. So um, same thing with software. Meeting the actual expectation, not so easy always. So basically, um, the design first paradigm or, or method or whatever you want to call it, it works perfectly fine on a simple and small project. Mostly because when you do it the wrong way, you can redo it within days. So failing is cheap in that case. So uh, I, I'm saying the waterfall, everything, perfect when you're talking about the project of 
some thousands of, of dollars or euros. Not a problem at all. When you move into more complex projects, it starts failing. It start, starts failing in, in spectacular ways often <laughs> and in very expensive ways as well. Um, so um, if you have a business environment that changes all the time, it's going to be really, really quite difficult to try to actually meet any requirement because the requirements have already changed before you, you get there. And uh, well, it's always about contracts. It's like, what do you have in a contract? And, and that's um, one of my <laughs> favorite topics is, is how to do contracts. Uh, because if you have a long list of requirements, thinking that you're going to be secure when you list all of those requirements, they're actually going to be really good for the vendor and really horrible for the customer because of the car example. They just check off all the requirements and they're done. They're out of there. That's it. So um, expectations or business goals not met, requirements met. So basically we have a problem here. Uh, not going into, into a lot of detail here, but it's a lot of guesses and uh, pretty high risk process model and so on. So what we uh, came up with eventually, and as we, I talk about like software community in this case is, is mostly agile, but there's, there's been all sorts of uh, agile projects even before this. Like if, if you look at some of the products that have been done using agile methodology, they include everything from like sending people to the space and, and building vacuum cleaners and doing some small websites and doing physical products. Uh, so all sorts of products have been done using Agile. And funnily enough, like uh, in about three weeks, <laughs> I'm going to be teaching Agile to one of our customers who wants to use it in their business. Uh, their business is building bridges and highways. They want to use Agile in that. So you can do it and, and you can do it in, in like any kind of business. Probably, probably I would not go and do scrum in building a bridge, like deliverables at the end of each print. <laughs> I, I don't probably, I don't go there, but you can use some sort of agile methodology at least. And, and that's going to be really interesting. And personally, I find a lot of uh, like enjoyment even on, on actually teaching different companies on how, how to become agile. And my personal view on this is like in 10 to 20 years, we have like two kinds of companies. We have the ones that are agile and the ones that are dead. So, you know, you can pick the bunch. Uh, agile in, in, a, in a nutshell, shortly. Three basic principles, pretty much in any agile methodology. Um, always deliver something visible within like fixed intervals. Fixed intervals, they can be hours, days, weeks, months, depending on, on your business and what you do. Typically, we are talking about a few weeks in, in case of software. Uh, always start with the highest priority items. Never start, start with the details first and never start with the favorite ones. Always start the ones with create most value. And value can be different things for different organizations, but there always is some value in, in the work we do, or there should be at least. Uh, and improve the process. Never stop learning. So basically, you should always try to learn from, from your own mistakes and your successes. For example, uh, in, in Wundercrowd, what we do, like other companies have an employee of the month. We have fail of the month. What we do is we, we celebrate failure. So we actually re reward people from actually bringing up their failures and how to make sure that why it happened and how to make sure nobody else does the same failure in the entire organization. So we try to reward it. Because if you fail fast and fail cheaply, it's going to be good for the organization. If you fa fail slowly, it's going to become expensive and that's going to kill companies and you know, people are going to be really pissed off. And we actually sent, sent this stuff to our customers as well. Look, we failed on your project. <laughs> Some of them are first like, what? <laughs> but it's okay. And, and they even pay for all the work that we, we do while, while failing. And, uh, as a CEO, you know, it's sort of a fun thing because I get to do the most expensive failures. The ones I do, they, they can have like six figures in them. So, uh, you know, developers failing, it's cheaper, usually. Uh, Agile is not a new thing as such. Uh, it's been done for ages. Uh, the Agile we know today started from software. But if you think about what, what NASA was doing when they put man into moon, it's, it's not like they designed everything perfectly and just 
press the button and launch and there we go. Uh, they actually do a lot of like small iterations, trial and error and so on. So it's, it's sort of a similar approach even though they didn't actually call it agile. There's a thing called Pareto principle. Um, if you want to know who, who this guy Pareto was, go and, and look at the Wikipedia page uh, for that. Uh, but basic idea here is you get 80% of the value in, in typically any project within 20% of, of the total effort. Meaning most of your efforts are going to be more or less wasted if you just look at the value generation. Perfect example when, when building a Drupal website. I think something like 70 to up to 90% of your time is spent on tweaking the details and doing the theming and making sure the round uh, table, like the corners are round and there's drop shadows. Who the hell cares? Like if you look at the business case, there are cases where it's important, but in many cases, that's going to be exactly the long tail here. Yeah, it adds some value, but you know, considering the effort, does it really? And if you start by the most, most, uh, valuable tasks and get the 20% out of the way. At this point, it's not up to you to decide if I'm assuming a, a like a customer uh, vendor relationship here, but it's not up to you as a, as a vendor to decide if something gets done. It's up to the customer and it's up to the business value. So if the drop shadows and rounded, rounded corners are what actually makes the site tick, Fine, but the customer knows the actual expense. So it's no longer just a requirement. It's actually something that has a price tag to it. It's like, am I willing to pay 25,000 euros to get this all over the site? It, it makes doing projects a bit different at that point. So this is really, really important to keep in mind. Um, Agile in general, there's a lot of different methodologies. I'm, I'm not going to go into these in detail. Uh, I just left a slide for these here. So if, if you want to Google a bit around and get to know some other agile methodologies than, than Scrum that is most widely used in software development, please do. Because there's many of these are really, really applicable what, what many of us do, like Kanban for, for maintenance, for example, uh, Lean for running a company. It's a perfectly good example on, on how to run an agile company as such. Um, so it's a good idea to, to take a look, look at some of these. And um, we as a Drupal uh, community, uh, I'm sorry to say we haven't been really all that great in, in many of the agile things traditionally, mostly because the testing of Drupal, like test driven development, all of these practices, Drupal as a platform has not really been ideal to do that. Like traditionally, if you compare it to Java or Ruby on Rails or many of the other platforms. So uh, many people in Drupal community don't know all of these as well as they should. And it's a good idea to, to educate people because we are not, not always the cutting edge in any of these things. Uh, we can also learn from outside of Drupal community. So um, Agile Manifesto, uh, basically this is the starting point for, for Scrum. And it's also um, like foundation of, of many other Agile methodologies. It's like, individuals and, and interactions instead of having a really, really nicely defined process and so on. Uh, so basically you have people working with people. And I hope I could, you know, one of these days push this message through to the schools as well, uh, because I'm sure all of you have realized that there are next to no female developers in open source because they think, you know, you're working alone in like room with no windows and no sunlight and all night just coding with pizza and coke. Uh, that's not exactly true anymore because this is really, really working with people and it's about interactions and being face to face with your customers and your end users and, and like everybody. Uh, and, you know, I would hope to have some female developers to hire because we have next to none. Oh, we have some, but not that many. Uh, working software is more important than, than documentation. Don't take it overboard. <laughs> Don't forget to do any documentation because that also happens, but it's more important to deliver something that, that's like functional, that adds value than to, to document everything in detail. Because uh, especially in case of Drupal, sometimes writing documentation takes just as long time as implementing something. So you don't want to redo both of them when you do changes. Uh, customer collaboration over contract negotiation. And this is a imp really important thing as well because it's much easier to do uh, agile 
internally in an organization. I, I go to all of these agile events quite often and, and when I speak to other people, eight out of 10 or nine out of 10, 10 are from like organizations that do agile internally, not like vendor customer relationship, but their own teams. And they are always amazed like, how do you manage to sell agile like externally to anyone? Is it even possible? <laughs> and, and I'm always saying like, well, it's not simple, uh, but, and it takes a lot of time, but you, you manage to do it and, and you end up actually making bigger impact on the customer organization than just doing a project for them. Because if, if you do it well, it can actually spread within the customer organization. Um, and this is really, really, if I look at their own markets, for example, uh, in Finland or Sweden, we can do a contract for like 1 million euro project, like by doing an email only, that's done. You know, in, in, in Germany, they would die out of heart attack if somebody would try to do that for like 10,000 euro project. It's like, what? No contract. No, we can't work. Uh, so this is really, really a cultural thing and how much stuff do you have to have you in your contracts? And I've had a lot of fun battles with like internal legal teams in different organizations, like what's a proper contract and what do you have to have in there? And those discussions are always fun. Um, <coughs> responding to change is more important than following a plan. We can't plan perfectly. We have to plan. We can't just do stuff. We still have to plan, but we don't have to have a perfect plan in the beginning. We can respond to the change instead. Um, this is the traditional iron triangle of, of projects. So basically we can fix contents, resources and, and time. And then basically in the middle, what we would have is quality. Uh, one of them is going to be flexible. And if we hide the quality behind them, quality is the one that is going to be flexible in the end. Uh, because if you try to push for somebody to do a lot of work for, for, for free, for not enough resources, uh, you know, they have to find shortcuts somehow. Uh, instead of sacrificing the quality, uh, make the contents flexible. It's much better to be flexible on the actual scope than to be flexible on resources or time. So that's the, that's the real trick there. <laughs> then we have uh, just-in-time planning where instead of doing this, this is the, the traditional model. And the problem in, problem in this is what if we run out of budget like in here? We have a few options. We can stop it there deliver no value whatsoever, decide, you know, we failed the project, that's that. Uh, we can invest more money into the project and go over budget and never know what the end result is exactly going to be or so on. Or we can just cut it back in the coding phase and decide, well, we planned all of this, but we can't implement all of it because we don't have money for it. So we spend extra time on, on planning and analyzing and designing stuff we never even do. So basically, this is the simple way of doing it. Plan a bit, don't go into any details, and then do all the detailed planning in, in phases always. Just analyze the most important bit first, implement it, make sure it's already run, ready to be run and so on. Move to the next one. So we still do all of these same phases. It's not like we are removing stuff. This is what ends up happening if, if we uh, do it right. So basically same chart that earlier today, uh, we still do decisions in these points, uh, but we do very few decision, decisions before uh, doing an agreement. Um, one of my uh, favorite customers, like a really, really big global uh, company, um, we were discussing uh, like, what do you want to do with us like next year? This was like last year. And they said, well, uh, yeah, we have a budget of, of like 300,000 uh, euros, like beginning of the year. So what do you want to do? We don't know yet. We just have budget allocated because, you know, there's always going to be some need. So just book some people and we'll figure it out. That's the way to do it. <laughs> and and we, we do really amazing things with these people for, for this reason. We, we don't have to plan ahead so much. We just book people and, you know, based on trust. Well, uh, a bit of design first and then the decisions, you know, we know more and more when we do the decisions. Typically, we do some sort of uh, pre-launch. We can still change a lot of things and, and so on. So it, it starts to look quite different uh, when, when you do it like this. Uh, the benefits, uh, the red line is, is agile and the black line is, is more traditional. Uh, so visibility, we know all the time, whereas we think we know everything with, with traditional in the beginning. 
then we don't see anything and in the end we hopefully know, know everything where we are going. Adaptability is pretty obvious. Uh, business value, we deliver stuff right away and less and less value generated. This is like complete the opposite. Everything is delivered in the end, hopefully. Uh, and the risk, same thing. Risk goes down all the time but goes down slower in the end. So it's, it's quite beneficial. So uh, that's, the, that's the basics. Um, what about like why don't, do, why don't all of the organizations do Agile and, and exclusively Agile? Uh, this is the basic image that is, you know, this is your Agile and this is what I described and it's beautiful and it's like sexy and it's whatnot. And real life, well, sort of. <laughs> it's, uh, it's flexible, <laughs> but uh, it's not always making everything like cool and sexy and, and that. And that's the first thing. You still have to do all of your work. It makes your work a bit more fun and flexible, but a lot of the same stuff is still there. Um, this is one of my favorites because it's also true. Yeah, um, Agile training, let's say Scrum for example. If you do a certified Scrum Master um, certification basically for yourself, it's gonna take like full two days and a bit of pre-reading. So that's a huge effort, you know, you get a fancy title of Certified Scrum Master. Woohoo! Our office doc is actually Certified Scrum Master. <laughs> or at least he's been taking part of like four or five uh, <laughs> Scrum Master courses by now, so I think he has to be. Uh, but it's very easy to learn the basics. It takes a few days. But actually to learn how to do Scrum, for example, as an organization, it takes years. Uh, so I would say like within six months you're somewhere, within two years, well then you know something already because it's, it's like a cultural shift. It's changing of your mindset and how do you think, think things and so on. So it takes a long time to turn an organization. And if, if you try to do Agile and if the, there's no support from like the top level management, it's always going to fail at some point. Uh, because then it comes down to the trust and, and all that. Going to get back to that. So, the basic reasons of failure I've seen and I would say based on, based on some of the customers I've been talking with, uh, they say that uh, something like 8 or 9, 9 out of 10 shops that approach them and tell them they are Agile, they are really not. They just claim they do Agile. I've seen all of the big IT companies do it. They just slap a Agile sticker on, on top of what they're already doing, put up some fancy marketing materials and they call it Agile. I'm not saying all of them do it and, and, and this is obviously, some of them might be excellent in it, but I, I've seen it way too many times that they only use it as a marketing thing. It's, it's not gonna solve anything. So basically, if, if you don't have the trust in place, internally or externally, that's, that's going to mean the Agile is likely to fail. Um, if you have the lawyers, everybody likes lawyers always, uh, but they can actually block Agile if, if they enforce the contracts in a bad way. Um, that happens unfortunately quite often. Uh, one of my <laughs> personal favor favorite, it's, it's not like, it's not a very intuitive thing to do because uh, what do you do by default is you plan for something and then you do it, right? If you have to, let's say, move, get, uh, relocate to a new apartment, uh, what do you do? You plan for it, how to do it, okay, book somebody to do it, whatnot, and then actually implement it. This is what we do. But if you look at like how children behave, they don't plan, they just do. So I, I, I wonder why it's not like, it's not the intuitive way to do things, but naturally it should be. But it's not the case. Well, not a topic for today, but we, we could have a very long discussion about that one. Um, cultural things, um, it's easy to fall back to the old ways uh, for the reason it's not, not intuitive. Uh, easy to go there. Customer vendor, always lack of trust makes, makes it fail quite easily. And no training and no support. So this is what it actually looks like when, when you do uh, Agile in, in the beginning. And one of the reasons why, why quite a few companies fail is that they get all of these fancy online tools and software for doing Agile. No. You have computer scientists in room, you know, what you do, you do paper-based process. Because it actually works. Uh, the best way of starting to do Agile is do it physically in one room. Use physical paper, physical evidence on what you're actually doing. It makes it so much easier to get started with Agile. 
uh, this is lacking always, or not always, but quite often. Uh, you don't have face-to-face -face contact, you have distributed teams, you don't meet with your customer enough. Uh, in an ideal situation, the entire team would be in the same room all the time, including the customer, or if it's internal thing, including the business owner. So that would ide ideally be the situation. Uh, again, when you're getting started, it's going to be really, really difficult to uh, actually do anything else. So try to stay in the same room. Um, this is Scrum, as I'm sure you are aware of. M myself, not so much, but <laughs> uh, in here, I think you've seen this uh, quite a few times. Uh, so there's only one ball and quite a few guys. So might be there's some overhead sometimes uh, in, in case of Drupal. So that might actually cause some, some Drupal agile projects to fail. I'm going to get back to that in a minute. So what Scrum requires, and this is actually true to a lot of other Agile, but since most of us doing Drupal projects uh, do them using Scrum, I'm talking only about Scrum here. Uh, development team has to stay the same. If it keeps on changing, you can't really learn. Uh, it's really, really difficult if it's always a new bunch of people. Try to keep the team the same. Uh, it requires trust. I've said it like 10 times, but I have to say it over and over again because that's, I think, the most common way of, of failing Agile. Uh, and content has to be optimized just in time, meaning you don't fix the contents ahead of time. You optimize it when, when needed. And uh, you have to reprioritize and reprioritize things all the time because you learn more. Some more things. Uh, testing demonstration and feedback in every sprint or whatever your iterations are called. Uh, and uh, you have the total cost of ownership thinking, not meaning if you save a bit of money here, is it going to come back and, and bite you in the backside at the later point when you, when you do like administration for the next three years or whatever the lifespan of the product is going to be. And uh, not saving the wrong places basically. And uh, well, and product success has to be defined in, in, in general. Uh, if you don't know what the success looks like, it's quite difficult to, to actually succeed. So you have to know the actual business goals. Surprisingly, this is not always completely clear. We talk to a lot of customers and sometimes when you really ask them difficult questions on like what your business goals for this are, they don't always know it in detail. So it's like, okay, it's fine that you don't know any of the details, but we have to know what we are aiming for here or define it at least. Um, it will fail if, uh, if the team can't, can't solve the problems, meaning if they don't have the authority to do so or the skills or whatever you need to solve the problems. Uh, so the problems have to be solvable one way or, or another. Uh, limited experience, and this is especially true when, when talking about customer vendor kind of thing. If the customer hasn't done Agile before and the vendor hasn't done Agile before, it's not, not really a good starting point. Uh, if you are in that kind of situation, hire somebody with experience. <laughs> That's pr practically the only way of actually getting started with it. If you have a vendor with a lot of experience or even a customer with a lot of experience, it's going to be a lot easier because then somebody knows what's going on. Uh, so at least somebody has to, has to know it. Um, and the commitment issues is, is the, if let's say it's a startup and uh, customer doesn't know what to do next week, they always change priorities completely. And this happens in small startups a lot. Uh, and, and Drupal is not really great at this either. Um, so if you don't, can't commit for something like few months or so, this is what we are going for, it is going to be really difficult. So Agile works, but if it's a complete chaos, it's still going to continue to be complete chaos, even if you use Agile. So, um, and Last but not least, if you plan everything perfectly. That's, that's a sure way to fail with, with Agile. Uh, there's a bit of about um, project uh, against product, but I think I covered most of these. So I'm just going to move into, into the um, Drupal bit. So what do we do with Drupal? Um, this is Captain Drupal, by the way. Uh, if, if you haven't uh, seen him before, he's one of our uh, dear friends that uh, appears in some conferences sometimes and does all sorts of funny things. We also do have a like life size, like this big uh, Drupal icon with like man in it. So <laughs> all sorts of stuff. 
Um, so a few words about Drupal. Basically, uh, if you think about what we used to do is we used to have only like frameworks that we used to build software and code it. And this is where Agile was quite, you know, working really well because it's all coding. Then we ended up having some CMS products that were basically, you know, out of the box products that fulfilled your need or not, but it was at least out of the box completely functional. And we ended up having something in between. I'm calling them platforms here. Uh, we are actually calling Drupal these days uh, content management framework instead of CMS because it's a really crappy CMS. You can build a CMS out of it, but if you look at it like out of the box, it's not really, you know, calling it a CMS, it's sort of confusing. So, so we decided to call it content management framework. And this is sort of the differentiation. There's a lot of stuff behind it, but I'm, I'm not going to go there in detail. So, so basically this is where we are in like grand scheme of things. And uh, this, this sort of has an impact on, on what we can do with Agile. Uh, this is one of the, the primary things that, that actually makes a big difference. Uh, what we have in Drupal is features are cheap, cheap and, and details are expensive. Uh, you spend most of your time working on, on details because all of the features, you know, there's a module for that. So at least in theory, you get really complex functional Drupal site built in a day and then you really start working. So that's, that's the big thing. Uh, makes estimation quite, quite difficult. And, and funnily enough, with Drupal, what you do is you start with the working product and, and you spend the development project breaking it. Uh, so uh, th this happens in most projects. It's, it's sort of completely the opposite for what the like, okay, let's deliver something of value uh, like at the end of each sprint, meaning we broke views on this sprint. Yeah, <laughs> some value. Uh, this makes it a bit difficult uh, because the way Drupal has been built and, and it's, it's not really optimal for, for Agile always. Um, so, but Drupal, you know, there's still coding required um, almost always, not, not quite, but uh, in, in big professional cases, at least always. Um, and, you know, we have to live with, with Drupal today. So, um, I'm talking about like typical programming projects for a while here. So if you look at typical Drupal projects, they tend to be rather small. They are not like two year projects with like 20 person team working on them full time. They are quite a bit smaller. And, and for example, Scrum was originally designed for teams of seven to nine people working together for like years. Doesn't happen in that many Drupal projects. There are Drupal projects out there that do it, but it, they are really the exception, not the rule. Um, so we have tiny short projects. High velocity, we do stuff too quickly. Our biggest problem is that the product owner who's responsible on, on how to prioritize things and how to accept if something is done or not, they, they can't keep up. We are delivering stuff too quickly, so we have to slow down. So almost always when a customer comes and says, can you deliver this within this time frame? It's like, yes, we can, but you can't. <laughs> and then we cut back the team and make it smaller <laughs> and make it on a level uh, that, you know, the customer can also sustain and add some consulting and, and, and so on. So that's, it's sort of a funny problem to have, but it's absolutely a problem if you consider agile. Um, Drupal compared to other platforms, the documentation is missing in action often. Uh, there's no real standards on how to document Drupal site like the entire Drupal site. There are some, but we should have like a proper standard for it. So at least internally, it's a good idea to have some way of, of documenting Drupal. Uh, Drupal estimation is, is a, a funny topic uh, because in, in software, when you misestimate something, your estimate can be off by say 20%. In Drupal, it's off like 100 or 1000 fold because you know, you estimate it, there's a module for it, I'm gonna use it, and then you use it for like a week and realize it's complete crap and you have to rewrite it. Or there's like core issue that you have to really fix before you can actually use what you are supposed to do. So your estimates, when they are off, they are really off. So quite a bit, quite a bit more difficult than, than in traditional. Uh, and uh, yeah, complete like test coverage and continuous integration, you can do all of it in Drupal but it's gonna cost you more than the actual Drupal project in, in most cases. Again, it's sort of a happy problem. It's a problem of Drupal being so efficient to do that testing becomes more expensive than the actual project. 
it's sort of sort of happy problem, but it's it's a problem where the customer sees like, well, how come the testing is like twice as expensive as the project? Sometimes that's the case. Well, how do we fix this? Do we have like ten minutes? Okay, I'm gonna try to leave a bit of yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna leave a bit of time for questions then. Uh, so basically, prototype-driven development is the first thing. We have a working product. Use it. Use the product out of the box. See what you already have and start with that. Then you can start changing things and you can start giving options to the business owner. You can say, well, we can do this in like 20 minutes and that's going to be 85% of your requirements are going to be done. Or we can spend like two weeks on it and then 100% is going to be done. Which one do you want to pay for? It becomes a business decision. It's no longer like this is the triple way of doing it. It's a business decision. It's like one of what makes sense in this case. Sometimes spending two weeks is a good idea. Sometimes 20 minutes is enough. Depends on, on what your business. Um, all right, moving on. So this is the ba same basic uh, model here where uh, the important bit is build something first out of the box within minutes or, or within hours. Don't spend a lot of time on it because you are likely to modify it anyway. Have a look at the, the UX, the business. Is it going to fulfill the, the business goals? Uh, have a look at the technical uh, implementation part. Uh, create options. Options A, B, C, if possible. And basically implement it, reiterate when needed. So this is the same thing that I actually just said. So basically uh, we can have a number of options and this happens a lot in Drupal projects. You always have more than one way of, of uh, doing stuff. So let's have a look at flexible Scrum a bit. So basically there's a few basic parts here and uh, in order to, to leave a bit of time for questions, I'm going to skip some of them. But um, discovery, this is uh, your basic design of your project. It's not actually designing anything. It's like discovering most of the things listed here. Uh, so create some sort of backlog. Do a bit of project planning because you have, if you have to do integrations, for example, and if there's a lot of different parties involved, you have to do some sort of timetables for them. When do we expect this integration to be done if there's two parties and so on. Uh, quality, answer, uh, quality assurance and, and uh, steering group kickoff, so on. But remember to stay on a high level on all of those. Uh, one week sprints instead of uh, two or three week. We used to do three week sprints, uh, cut it down to two weeks and realized that's working better for Drupal. Uh, then we cut it back to one week and realized that's working even better for, for most of the projects at least. This has to do with the high pace of, of the project. It's easier to, to cut it down in like every week and do really short reviews and plannings and so on. Uh, it just seems to work better. Um, not always, but in most projects this seems to be the, the case. And small team. A uh, few roles. Uh, a typical team on doing a, let's say, 100,000 euro Drupal project. A typical team would be, I would say, five people, including the business owner from the customer side. So they are tiny, really, really tiny as software teams. Uh, and that works perfectly. It's easier to split Drupal projects to, to multiple teams than to, to build a big Drupal team working around one project, at least in my experience. Um, limited testing perhaps. Um, I'm not saying this is the way to go. Uh, this is the unfortunate side effect of, of uh, Drupal pricing, meaning Drupal is so efficient that, that testing looks expensive. And it depends. If you have like a disposable small project, you know, just trust on out of the box Drupal security and trust that the developers know what they're doing and skip on the, the security reviews. Not exactly a best practice. Sometimes you have to do it. Uh, same goes for, for like scalability testing and, and so on. If you have a, a long project that is going to be ongoing years, different thing. This is what we do to, to uh, remove, partially remove the bottleneck of, of uh, product owner. We add business consultants. Uh, we have add senior people who understand the business of the customer, who can help them to prioritize and, and basically do a lot of the like legwork for, for the customer. Uh, so we, we basically not exactly double the bandwidth of the product owner, but like 1.5 times or something like that, the bandwidth. Uh, it, it helps quite a bit. 
quality assurance, this is another topic that we could spend like an hour on. Uh, so basically, remember to, to have business level quality assurance, meaning a steering group. Uh, in my mind, quality assurance is not about technical quality assurance. That's like one part of it. Like the business assurance, making sure we do the right things, that's the most important bit. And, and the next important thing is like the like end to end. Is the user experience there? Is everything there? The technical bit is actually surprisingly simple. Rest of it is, is a bit more complicated often. And uh, yeah, um, if you want to do agile contracting, create a contract that says that the steering group can change basically anything within the contract. And the steering group, you know, has to, or everybody has to agree. It's no voting. Uh, our steering groups typically have four people in them, uh, like basically the product owner from the customer side, scrum master from our side, and then we have like their bosses basically. So if we have to add budget to the project or whatever, we can do it in any steering group right away. That makes it flexible also. Even if the contract says something, we can do binding decisions on the spot right away. And actually quite often I also do. So I think I left like five minutes for, for questions as well. Um, I, so three questions in, in one. Okay. <laughs> so when you do this one week sprint, um, there's a story card, there's some kind of, uh, you know, do you get a sign off from the, the customer saying that it's done? Yeah. And, and then the second question is, uh, you know, so how do you manage that go across multiple multiple sprint cycles. Uh, and third question was, um, no, I'll, I'll, I'll stop at that. Uh, okay, okay, so the question was, uh, what about um, basically what's the definition of done? So how do you get a sign off from the customer when some story is done? Um, basically, when you're defining the story, you should first of all have a definition of done that's always there, like it's being tested and whatnot like the basics, and then you have the actual definition of none of this story. Like if it's a checkout form for, for an e-commerce site, when it does these things, then it's going to be done. And, and that's always done. Is that done by the customer or internal? Uh, together, <laughs> together. So basically customer agrees on, on definition of done, uh, but it's like everybody's working together on those. Yeah, so if you have like a perfectionist there who, who wants to add everything on top of it, yeah, you have those people, but that, that's why you have like planning poker and whatnot, so you can do the same sort of principle on these. Like, okay, how many points do we need for this story? And then the perfect, perfectionist is like there and everybody else is there. So, so basically he has to come down on a more reasonable level and we have to remove some of the points of definition of done. Do you do that up front? Or? Yeah, well, when you're doing the planning, you should do that. Uh, what was the follow-up? I already forgot. So, so, and how do you bill on? Do you bill on done? Or, uh, oh, uh, the billing. Yeah, well, that's a long topic. Uh, we, we, we typically bill on sprint today. Uh, I would like to... The activity during the sprint? Yeah, yeah. I would, uh, no, no, no. I, it's, um, billing is... Let, let's not go there. It's a r really long topic and we have only a few minutes. It's agile billing. We should do another session on that. <laughs> yeah. How does that work in a support model after the project's completed that you want to continue support for that product? Uh, and obviously your development team, they want to go on and do new projects, they want to do other things. So now you have poor documentation and a team that doesn't know much about the product. Yeah, so um, that's, um, the question was about how do you, when you have poor documentation, you are not prioritizing that and you are handing the project off when it's done to, to some support team that is going to support it. Um, I don't think there's like a one silver bullet kind of answer for that. One way of, of doing it is having the same team to actually support it as well. We've tried it. Uh, it works. It has some problems. A uh, lot of benefits as well. If it's like an ongoing project, a lot of stuff is happening all the time. It's really good. 
if it's like really a site that is like one off, it's done, it's done, and nothing is happening, then obviously it's not, not a good model. Uh, other way is, is standardizing your like Drupal stack basically using the same bits for, for all of this. Is what we've done with NodeStream, for example. Uh, we've also done that. That also has a lot of problems. <laughs> and, and you know, third way is having some sort of hand of, of, of procedures where you ensure certain documents are in place and so on. Uh, I don't think there's, we haven't at least found like one way of doing Drupal like development versus support and maintenance. So what do you do if you uh, end a sprint where you have stories that are undone? Uh, the stories will end up back to the backlog and they are going to get reprioritized uh, and re-evaluated as well. So sometimes what happens is they're going to end up like way down into the backlog because if we realized it's going to be really an expensive story and the business value is not as great. Uh, what we do in, in steering groups is we evaluate all the like epic stories like the really really big whale of a story. Uh, that we, we have a look at the estimated business value and the estimated effort. And we try to pick the ones that are like in a sweet spot, like, okay, they might be really low on, on, on um, the effort, and then it's going to be easy to do them, even if they don't have that much value, or they might be huge on business value, in which case we can invest more work into them. So it's like, comes down to evaluating your, your stories, basically. And what about time Yeah. That's where the failing comes in. If the, if the customer goes and you know you just spend a week uh, on, on doing something, if it's for technical reasons, uh, then then you have to come up with uh, with a good reason or a good excuse <laughs> why that happened. Uh, but usually there's a really good reason, and and quite often it's like also out of your hands, because um, we don't really offer like warranty for third-party modules as such. So we we don't go saying like any issue or bug you ever had have in your project, we are gonna fix it for free. So we're running over time. So just one more question. I'm sorry, and you, you're about to uh, grab Beth. I hope not yeah. literally, but figuratively, grab him afterwards anyway. Yeah. Well, let's. You can share what is your uh, common um, common denominator on the most expensive mistake and how do you go about it? <laughs> oh, most expensive. What, what were the mis uh, most expensive or most common mistakes? Uh, most common must be that the, the uh, developers want to do stuff the Drupal way, meaning spending three weeks instead of three minutes or something. <laughs> that has to be the most common. Uh, it is good for like developing Drupal and moving it forward, but it's not really great for a customer project always. Uh, most expensive ones, um, I think they are like entirely outside of the realm of, of Drupal. Uh, most expensive ones are Drupal, probably like picking bad customers and not firing the customers in time. We've, we've managed to fire one customer three times and sometimes they always manage to come back to the organization and we always have to fire them again in a while and that, that, you know, that gets expensive at some point. So you do fire customers? We do fire customers, yeah. You, you should do it because sometimes you end up with bad customers. So uh, customers should fire us if we suck and the other way around as well. So. Fantastic. Well, listen, um, I'd like uh, to just on behalf of all of you, thank you, Vesa, for that fantastic info. Obviously, you've got a lot more information than we had time for, and I'm sorry about the technical hitches to start with, um, but uh, Vesa will be around today and tomorrow. Sorry to dob you in. Uh, so please uh, get, get hold of him if you have extra questions, uh, and uh, please thank Vesa Palamol. Thank you.